Hi, good morning. My name is Daniel Carenter, and I am with Central Florida Lifestyle Magazine. And today, I am here with the winner of the 6th Annual Live Art Contest Best of Show Award, Mr. D. Deloy. And today, we're going to talk about him and his masterpiece, The Watchmaker's Daughter. So, without further ado, let me introduce uh, today's star, Mr. D. Deloy. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Danny, it's good to see you. It's great seeing you as well. Thank Thanks. you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm glad I'm here. This is great. Thank you for being here. This is a, a real honor for me. Absolutely. You know, we're going to find out more about you and your processes and whatnot, and I'm very excited to delve into it. So, that being said, can you walk us through your creative process? Sure. Well, you know, when I first got this job, it was a situation where I, I knew about Corey Ten Boom, but I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about what I would do as far as a piece of artwork. And I knew that she was a watchmaker. She turned out to be the youngest licensed watchmaker in all of Holland. Her dad started teaching her at 10 years old. And so uh, they lived in a place called Harlem, Holland. And that was their big deal and stuff was to be watchmakers and repair and all of that there. And they lived in the same house. So I started doing some research on it. The book that came out called The Watchmaker's Daughter, was this was done basically for that book. Um, it was to be to try and help the sales of that book and so the, that the author would uh, be able to get on the New York Times bestselling list based on the sales of his book. And so giving a free piece of artwork out to people that uh, pre-sold or that pre-bought the book was the big deal and stuff. That's why it was even done in the first place. So my creative process was just sitting down and doing all this research. So I spent hours and days uh, collecting and, and gratefully, uh, you know, we've got things like the internet these days. You can go to Pinterest and you can Google images and all of that. And you can find so much more than I used to be able to find in my National Geographic. <laughs> so, so I was able to do a lot of that and collect a lot of pictures that would help me. Well, the, the pictures of uh, Corey and her dad were done way back in the 40s. And so when she had the pictures of her that were in color, she was much older at that time, so we needed to find something that was going to be a lot younger for me to be able to do this the way that I wanted to. So the pictures were always black and white, and they were very hard to see as far as being able to gather the information that I wanted to find out what she looked like when she was younger. So that was a big, big deal to do that, to find all the pictures that I need. So I had amassed a whole lot of, a lot of pho photographs for that. Well, I did a sketch initially. And basically, the idea came from this picture right here, which hung in their watchmaker shop for years. And it, it was a, a picture, apparently it was done by a Dutch person, I believe. And it had a poem underneath it that said, we should work on getting our lives together because the time on the clock is very little for us. So it it's basically shows a watchmaker at his bench with a woman standing beside him could be his daughter and overlooking him uh, making a watch. So I looked at that and I thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to make Corey looking over her dad's shoulder, who was her mentor and taught her how to make a watch and everything. So, so I had her and I wanted to get it in a way where it had some passion to it. It had some emotion to it where it showed daughter and dad together and how close that they were because they were very, very close. So Casper, who's the dad, had this very interesting beard. He was just a very interesting looking character, to say the least. Uh, just It was all kind of scraggly and everything, you know, but he was very proper and he would always wear his coat and he would sit at his bench and he was kind of a short guy. So he his elbows kind of came up to the top of his bench like this. You can kind of see how he would sit down low at the bench. Well, anyway, uh, what, what I thought would be cool would be to emulate this picture and put it in the picture itself. So you've got a picture within a picture. Mm. Uh, and that was a pretty neat idea, I thought, because by putting this in there, and plus it was in a public domain, so I could actually copy it line for line. So that's this is what it looked like. I don't know where it hung, but I put it in here at this place right here. The uh, other things that I saw in the pictures that I had of his, of his workshop was a, like a, a calendar up here. It had maybe like a work a worksheet that was hanging on the wall. And then a, a cabinet over here that contained all the watches that they fixed and that were ready to go. Most of them had tags on them. I didn't put the tags on, but it would show how they were hanging. So the idea was basically to give a real uh, warmth to this piece. Now, what happened was, <laughs> was I, when I drew the sketch initially, 
I was having a terrible time trying to get them to look down without them looking like they were asleep. <laughs> so, so uh, especially Corey. And the pictures of her when she was younger, she pulled her hair back really tight. And it was hard to capture the, the look that she had when she was younger. So there's a pastor across the street from me, from my studio, who uh, I asked to see if he and his wife would pose for me. I went over to their house, set up my camera. The pastor actually posed for me uh, at his table. He was a big man, and he, he had his arms out really big and everything, and it was great. It just worked out really well. And then his wife had the shaped face that Corey had. And so she pulled her hair back for me and everything. And so I shot all these pictures, a whole lot of uh, photos that helped me tremendously to do this piece. What happened, though, was when I was actually uh, transposing, you know, using her face and then trying to get uh, Corey's visage right and stuff, I, I still worked on the eyes over and over and over again because you don't see many, much of their eyes, but you want them to be, I wanted her to be focused down on what he was doing, uh, working on a watch, and I wanted him to be looking at that also. So that was one of the big things for me. I mean, I've been doing artwork for years, and I never have done anything where I've had to have people looking down that way. So it just every, it just kept on looking like they were asleep. So I kept working on that. And, uh, and finally, one day, I was able to get, I actually took pictures of my own eyes looking down and everything that kind of helped me a little bit. But it was a it was a really neat uh, thing, but when I started doing the piece, it turned out that the pastor's hands were very big because he, he was a large man. He looked like a big football player, and so his hands were quite big, and Casper was a very small man, very old at that time, and so um, I went across the street, and I've got a really, really good friend across the street from me who is an older man, and he had these great long fingers and, you know, just the perfect hands for it and everything. So these are his hands. <laughs> This is this is a Lamar's body, and this is his wife, and this is George's hands. So it it, uh, it worked out very well to be able to put it all together. And it took a while because one of the things I wanted to do was to make it look like an etching. This was probably an etching, and etching is when they carve into a piece of zinc plate or something like that, or a copper plate, and then they they ink over the top of it, wipe all the ink off, and the ink that sits into the etching area and stuff is what they press into the paper, so it becomes an etching. So I really wanted this to look like that. One of the things that you do is what they call cross hatching. So, so his coat, a lot of this stuff is all done with cross hatching, and I wanted to make the background look like it was from the World War II era. So I started experimenting with coffee and tea. So I, I got the, got my tea together and some sponges and began to start sponging some boards to find out how that would work. And when you make a board wet on one side, it curls, and so then you have to make it wet on the other side so you can flatten it out tape it down and everything. So I had a, that was a huge deal for me just to try and figure out how that was going to work on a bigger board like this. So I had to just keep on working on the board with the, with the sponge and then actually spraying the other side and then taping everything down so that it would flatten out. But once I got the background done, then I, I went and picked out like four different kinds of brown ink. And I wanted it to be a, a brown ink. I didn't want it to be black. And what was very interesting about this ink that I picked was when you mix it with water, it becomes more of a gold color. So this is the same color. What you see in here is the same color as the dark as the dark brown, but it was all done uh, just with one brush or pen and the same kind of ink the whole time. So um, that's that was kind of the whole message or the whole uh, the whole process that I was working with, and and a lot of it was just one little section at a time. You can't mess up because there's no way you can redo once you once you mess up with the ink. So this whole shoulder right here, you would never know, but that whole shoulder got goofed up when I was working on it. A lot of artists won't say that, but I, but it's okay with me because it was a blessing and a half because I, I had a ink eraser and I had an X-Acto knife and I scratched this entire section right here completely. I scratched off of the board and redid it. You would never know it. And I mean, I prayed over it. <laughs> So I believe I believe that that had something to do with it, but it was a uh, it was amazing uh, that it really came out the way it did. The biggest fear that that an artist has, I think, is that you'll either drop the ink on the work when you're tired or something, and somehow it, it falls on there and it messes things up, or that you make a mistake that you can't correct. 
So I was very blessed that, that uh, throughout the whole thing, if you look at how many lines that are in this, that uh, somehow it actually was able to come out well and stuff without having all the kind of problems and stuff that you could have with that. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> and actually by um, your answer, you actually answered my second question, which was what materials and techniques did you typically use for the artwork and how did you choose them? All of that is a huge creative process. And yeah. with that process, I'm sure that it's uh, daunting work. So tell me, Dee, mm -hmm. how do you stay inspired and motivated to create new art? Do you have any rituals or habits that help spark creativity? Well, I'll be honest with you. One of the things that I do before I ever work I'll actually pray I sit down and I, this is this is my thought uh, I've been a Christian for years and the thing that I've realized is that my talent it, I did not give myself this talent it was given to me from the very beginning and so I figure well God's the creator of everything so I just go to him and I say you know you created all of this I mean, you created a piece of grass. I mean, you created all these atoms that make everything up and stuff. And you didn't have any resource material. There was no Google images for you, God. <laughs> you know? So so you came out, you, know, you made this happen out of nothing. And so it inspires me so much to think the creator of the universe gave me a talent. So I, I just go to him and I say, if you would just give me just a little bit of that in this piece, everything, it will just blow the world off the map. So that's what I do to start with. That's my ritual, if you would, and stuff is just I sit right down at my desk and I pray, show me what you really want me to do. And so then from there, I just start doing some sketches and uh, I start just coming up with some ideas and everything and put things down in little thumbnail sketches that give me an idea of how something might lay out and put it all together so that I can get a good layout that's something that looks good. And then from there, that's when I start doing all the research and everything on it that, that gives me the, the resources that I need to be able to, to tighten everything up. And I take that sketch up to something bigger and then finally do all the details on it and stuff. And then from there, I take the materials that I'm going to finish it with, whether it's paint or ink or whatever it might be. And so I do most everything by hand. So I'm a Neanderthal. I guess that's the right word. <laughs> Because uh, everybody's doing stuff on computer these days. I don't know too much about all of that. I can make a wreck out of things with Photoshop. So I've chosen to do everything by hand. And with a piece like this, it was necessary to do it by hand, uh, to, to give it the kind of look that I wanted. And I think that that made a difference because your judges made a really big deal about that. Because I brought not only the piece that was printed uh, with a frame around it, but also this is the original uh, artwork itself. And they, they really enjoyed looking at the original work of how it was actually done. Excellent. Besides divine intervention, who are some artists that have influenced your work or inspired you through this artistic journey? Well, you know, I started off doing caricaturing. That's, that was my first big deal at Disney, uh, Disney World. And so uh, when I first went into college, I got a job there. And so I was looking at Mad Magazine. And everybody, everybody that's a caricature artist has drawn from Mort Drucker or Jack Davis. They were like the famous guys. And so I, I studied their stuff for years and years, reading Mad Magazine as a kid. And so my stuff looked a lot like theirs, like a lot of people's do. You know, the feet look the same, the hands look the same, everything. But that was my inspiration at that time. Uh, there were a lot of other caricature type artists and stuff. Bruce Stark was one of them and Hirschfeld was one. All of these guys were just, they were very inspirational to me and stuff to get started doing the cartooning. But when I got into, um, I got into a thing called paper sculpture and uh, doing that, uh, there were some great guys like Jeff Mishinaka and Leo Monahan who were just fantastic at paper sculpture, 3D cut paper and I did that for about 20 years and that's uh, I got nationally internationally known by doing that and then one day you know I walked into an ad agency and they said you're the paper sculpture guy and I said yeah yeah I am and they said oh nobody's using that anymore and I went oh <laughs> so, <laughs> so much for that idea so I kind of had to reinvent myself I guess the way Madonna always does you know and stuff you know you just have to <laughs> you have to come up with something new so I started painting and I started doing the covers of record album covers or back in the day when record albums were a big deal uh, before they came back in. They're coming back. They're though. coming back. I know. I'm hoping I get a chance to do some more. You know, that was really fun back in those days. But I was doing murals also. I was doing murals on walls. Started doing a, uh, children's books. I illustrated children's books, things like that. So I was doing a little bit more 
more realistic stuff, but my main focus was I loved humor. I just like to do humorous stuff, something that would pick people up and make them feel good. So that was kind of a big deal to me was to study under that that kind of thing. So I was looking at humor, but some of the some of the guys that that painted the theatrical posters and everything, you know, for movies, uh, those guys were just amazing. Bob Peake, uh, who did uh, you know uh, so many amazing uh, pictures and everything. So right offhand, I can't really remember all the people's names and everything, but they were. I, I would look at these things and I would go in when I was in college, I would look in the books and the art books and stuff and I'd study what they did. And, you know, sometimes I'd draw what they did just to, just to copy it and everything to see what kind of style I could get and everything because they were so good. So Norman Rockwell was my big guy. That was the guy. I've got like books and books up here in my bookshelf and everything on Norman Rockwell. The, the guys that used to draw at Disney and everything, I would I have a big a lot of Disney books and stuff and I would study the animation and everything that they did there. And of course, Da Vinci and Michelangelo, those guys, when I was in college, we used to have to draw from them. So I had a couple of pieces from Raphael that we had to copy and everything in pencil and all that. And then I look back then and I think, gosh, I was better then than I am today. You know, I just, I, it was just, you're, you're pushed sometimes when you got somebody that's giving you a grade and everything, you work extra hard for it, you know? And, but, um, uh, so I love those days back when I was really studying the masters. You can learn so much from all of that. So those are the kind of, I guess those are the folks that maybe have made a big mark in my life uh, these days with, uh, with that. Now, I studied a lot of people that, and I, I can't even tell you all the folks that I was looking at to do this kind of work. But if you ever seen the Praying Hands piece that's, that's so famous and everything, that, uh, that was one uh, because he did uh, etchings in that. And so that was something that was really, really special for me. And that I, I looked at that kind of work a lot when I was doing this. Excellent influences for your artwork. Now, granted, as famous as they are, they've gone through their own challenges. So, D, what are some of the challenges you face as an artist and how have you overcome them? <laughs> Gosh, you got a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, boy, there's been so many. I mean, just just the idea of when I was mentioning about dropping ink, I have worked many, many nights. Most most artists I know, they work all night long sometimes. And back when I was doing a lot of work for ad agencies and they were pressing you on the time period that you had, didn't have much time. So you were working all night, sometimes two or three nights without any sleep and be working at the board. And of course, I'm not, uh, you know, if you're working on a computer now, you don't have to worry about knocking ink over or messing things up. But uh, a couple of times I actually had dropped ink on my artwork. When I was doing paper sculpture, I would wake up and the exacto knife fell off my board into my foot or something, you know, I mean, things like that, you know, you just wake up and then you see the exacto sitting right there by your eye because I crashed out on the board. Those are some of the things that sometimes you go through when you get really over, you know, you're tired and you don't know what's going on. But uh, there, there are always ups and downs when it comes to having your own business. And I had many, many good years that went really well. I did Disney's 20th anniversary lithograph that took about 700 hours. And that was a fantastic year for me, uh, Anheuser-Busch's Christmas card. Uh, some of those things were all done in paper sculpture. And so I had some great jobs the next year, three months with nothing. So it, it goes up and down a lot of times. Uh, I've worked on children's books, uh, illustrating them. And one of them actually took me a, a, a total of seven years to get one done because the pay isn't always good sometimes. And so, you know, you, you got to take it as you go and everything. You can't just work on it straight ahead or you couldn't afford your bills. So sometimes that you have to you have to work out the money. You got to be able to work out with the people, and everything, too, which is something I've always felt really blessed about. I've always had some really great clients. And uh, for the most part, <clears throat> just being able to work with them has just been great. I, I love the interaction with people. So I sometimes I'd rather be with the people than I would be sitting at the drawing board because <laughs> it's it's a little easier to talk to people than trying to come up with something. But I have really enjoyed the fact that I've got a talent that I can actually use. And I thank the Lord all the time that I can do something that I love to do. There's that old phrase that says, you know, if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life, you know. And so I've been very, very grateful. Uh, uh, 43 years now and stuff being in my own business and then six, seven, seven or eight years at Disney uh, working there. So it, that has been a real joy. Some of the challenges that you have is possibly coming up with a, a really good idea and then the art director shoots it down and you have to go back to the drawing board and come up with something completely different. The literal drawing board. Oh yes, the literal drawing board. Yes, yeah. When you, you feel like that you've got it 
you know, it's in your hands, you got it, and it's going well. And then they say, ah, oh, no, no, we're going to go a different direction. Those kind of things, they, that's, that always comes up. I think a lot of times if you get into a slump, I've had a few times where I've just, you know, they talk about writer's block. You can get an artist's block where you just cannot seem to come up with something that's going to be good. I had a struggle with that. If you've got emotional issues and stuff too, you know, where the things are going on, uh, my, my folks passed away at the first of the, the millennium. And when that happened, I had a terrible time trying to come up with good ideas. I look back on some of those things now and they were just blah. Uh, I just could not come up with a good idea. And I felt like I was I was uh, cheating the, the client because, you know, usually I would come up with something that was hopefully going to be really, really good for them. And then I just didn't feel like I really had the oomph to do what I needed to do. So things like that cause issues sometimes. But otherwise, I mean, it's been a great ride. I have been so blessed. I don't think anybody back in my high school would have ever voted me most successful for having a business for 43 years and stuff, you know. But I've been so grateful that I've been able to keep going that long. Uh, and still be able to do what I like to do. Well, I'm sure with that many years of your talent, you must have impacted people, which leads me to my next question. How do you believe art can impact people in communities, and what role does art play in your life? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, it's it's changed a lot, Danny, uh, over the years. Obviously, when I first started, I was doing it because I needed to pay the bills. I actually started my artwork in my parents' house. They gave me a room in the back, and I started my business back there. Got my own telephone number and everything. It was great. So I worked back there, and that was that was a great time being able to do that. Didn't have a lot of overhead. And I counsel guys now and stuff, people that, that are getting into their own business, try to tell them, try and keep the bills low as much as you can because a lot of them go out of business because they just can't afford to. I was fortunate because I didn't have a lot of overhead at that time. So... Artwork at that time was basically used just mainly for me to, to try and, you know, I was, I was new in the business. I wanted to get ahead and go out with my portfolio and, and show it. That back in those days, anyway, you could go and show a lot of your portfolio to people. Now they just want to see your website. So you don't get the interaction. And I've always enjoyed the interaction with people. So that was one of the biggest things for me. Then it kind of progressed after a while because then I got into the paper sculpture years and uh, that was my certain period of, uh, of doing something totally different than I'd ever done before. And that opened up a door for me internationally where I was doing uh, work that people would call me from Japan and places like that and stuff. And I'm going, no way, you know, two o'clock in the morning, somebody calls me on the phone and they say, hi, this is Johnny-san from, from Tokyo, <laughs> Japan. I thought, it was a, I thought it was a joke, really, and stuff. And I, I kind of played along with it for about five minutes and stuff until I found out it really was an advertising agency over in Tokyo. And they wanted to hire me to do a piece for the president of Japanese airlines and stuff. And I'm just going, oh my gosh, what did I just do? You know, I just <laughs> shot myself in the foot. But then I did a lot of caricaturing in the early days too. And I still do it. Uh, it's kind of a foundation for me. And so that gave me a chance to travel. So that was one of the big things. I remember when I was working at Disney, I was going to college at the time and I used to work on a Saturday and Sunday evening. And so on Saturday evening, everybody was going out. And Sunday evenings at my church, a lot of people would go to church and then they would go they would go out to, you know, the youth group and everything. And I was always griping to God and stuff going out there. Well, I got to work on the weekends. Rah, 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 rah. But one of my big prayers was that I could see the United States. And I was wondering how in the world would I ever do that? So when I finally got out, uh, I, I left Disney and went into my own business. I got a call from New York out of the blue. Who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm still saying, you know, it's, it's just the most amazing things that happen. But I got a call from an ad agency that found out that I did caricaturing. And they said, well, we'd like to send you to the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami Beach. We're going to pay for three days of you being down there, your whole bill, of, you know, your, your flight, the whole bit. We want to know how much it'll cost and everything for you to do caricatures for the American Banking Association. I'm going, whoa, I got so excited I accidentally hung up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that was back in the day before you had, you know, you could you could tell who you were talking to. And so fortunately, they called back. I got the job. And that group that actually hired me took me all over the United States for the next five years. And so the prayer that I had about seeing the United States came from me working at Disney and doing the things that I had to do that I was griping about. And so I, I had to say, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm so sorry, you know, you know, because, I mean, he used that very thing and stuff to be able to give me the opportunity to see places that I never would have been able to see on my own. So that was very exciting. So art kind of took me there 
at that time. I have always enjoyed the fact that people do artwork for social reasons. They do it for pleasurable reasons. I remember some of the cartoonists, the famous cartoonists, um, one guy, Roy Crane, used to live across the street from my folks uh, on a lake. And he was painting. Uh, he, he had given up doing any cartooning at that time. And he was standing in his backyard painting pictures and stuff. That was a solace to him and everything. So, you know, that's how he used art in his later retirement years and stuff. So a lot of people do it that way. The way that I like art today is that I feel like that it could be used to further good causes. So some years ago and stuff, I was going through a tough time. And I realized I was going to be by myself on a Christmas day. And I wasn't real crazy about that. And I thought, you know, I'm going to feel sorry for myself. And I don't want to sit around feeling sorry for myself. So it turned out that I went to our local uh, Union Rescue Mission. And I, I, I thought, well, maybe I could do caricatures for homeless people. And so I went there and talked to them. They took me through their routine and stuff that I had to go through some kind of an orientation and everything. And then on Christmas morning, I was sitting in their dining room drawing women and children that were homeless, but that were, that were there at the Union Rescue Mission and, and doing that on Christmas morning. It was such a great, satisfying feeling. And again, God paid off because I was sitting there thinking, well, you know, I'll just finish up here and I'll go on home to an empty house and all that. And some friends called up and said, hey, we want you to come to dinner with us tonight. And I mean, just things like that happen all the time, all the time. So that was such a great opportunity and stuff to be able to do that. I drew for Arnold Palmer Hospital for a while, and I would go in and draw the kids that have cancer. And boy, I tell you, talk about sobering. I thought to myself, I'm doing these caricatures of these kids, but I'm not doing anything to be able to help them get well. And I came home and I said, God, I just, I'm just frustrated because I don't think I'm just doing anything that's going to make a difference. And you know what he said to me? Something's in the Bible, and it says, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And I started thinking, I've got Jesus standing behind me, watching me do what I'm doing just to cheer these little guys up and stuff just for just a couple of minutes. And it was being done unto him. And I just felt like that all of a sudden it just changed my perspective totally. And I think art has a big deal. It can change your perspective in the way you look. It can, it can make you feel better. Some people have uh, darker art and stuff. And, and I'm not real crazy about that because it can really bring you down. But there's every kind you can think of. I was raised on comic books. And so I, I used to draw comics all the time. I think that had an effect in my life over the years and stuff where I felt like that somehow I was going to be this big hero, you know, to everybody. But just because of the comic book art that I had, uh, you know, I was looking at for so many years. But I'm so grateful for that because at six years old, somebody gave me a comic book and that's where that's where my whole career started, basically, is just starting to, to draw from that. So, but things like this, these are things that I just know have got more significance than what I could ever imagine. I always say that it's it would be me to do a piece of artwork that's bigger than me. I've gotten to the point now where it's not so important and stuff that I that my name is everywhere and people see me and you know and I make a million dollars on anything and stuff. I used to think that was I was going to drive a Jaguar and live in a townhouse and stuff, you know, in, in Manhattan. That never happened. But you know, I am very content at doing what I'm doing because I feel like that somehow the CEO of my company has always been God. And I always feel like that if he gives me the idea, maybe there's something else that goes with this that's going to be bigger than me. And the fact that Lifestyle Magazine has been so kind to give me this award, it's that has just been everything. Just I would have never anticipated that when I just saw it online and, and just, uh, you know, filled out the application and sent in a picture and everything. I would have never thought in a million years that I would have this honor to be able to do this and have the opportunity to be able to have this platform to say the things that I'm saying right now. Well, Dean, <laughs> I must say you are quite a wholesome individual. You know, from the watchmaker's daughters to the caricatures of children at the hospital or at the homeless shelter or the paper sculptures. You've done it all, and I can say for easily for a fact that you have definitely made your impact with your art. And so, that being said, are you currently working on any new project or pieces, and could you possibly give us a sneak peek? Well... I am working on something uh, right now, and it's it's for somebody that I've known uh, that's a, that's actually retiring. So a, a company has gotten in touch with me uh, from up north, and they asked me if I would do a very detailed painted caricature of this person and stuff that I have known in my past. They didn't know that I knew him, but it was it was a friend of mine uh, years ago when I was going to school. And so I've been working on that for some time now and stuff for his uh, retirement. So they'll have a, some kind of a a party for him or a dinner or something, and, and they'll be giving this original uh, piece to him. So I'm very grateful. It's all the world to me, you know, something like that, because this was a fellow that was just so special to me for years and years growing up. And here I am 
you know, now I feel really old that I'm working on something for, you know, retiring now. But it was great just to be able to do something for this guy. And he has no idea. That's why I, I'm not going to say too much about it, because if this gets out real far and stuff, he might hear it. I don't know if he will or not. But it's, it's just really exciting to be able to do a piece for someone that you knew. And this will be something that'll be for, uh, special for him. Oh, that's lovely. I'm sure your friend's going to get a kick out of it. And, you know, (laughs) out of all people, right? It's a very small world. Yeah, it is. And so, like you said, you've been doing this for a while now. How do you envision the future of your artistic career? And what are your goals as an artist? Man, you know, I still have goals. When I first started, I had three goals that I wanted to do. I wanted to paint a mural. I wanted to illustrate a children's book. And I wanted to do a record album jacket. And At this point, I have done every one of those now. I've got three or four books to my uh, name now and stuff that I have uh, illustrated and uh, a couple of record album jackets. I've done murals all over over the city. It's it's just been a real blessing to have that. So I guess some of my goals now are I really, really want to inspire people by what I do. Uh, not, Not because of me. But because folks today, I mean, if you if you all you got to do is read the news for five minutes <laughs> and you walk away, you don't feel like, oh, my gosh, what's happening to our world? You know, so I, I really have a desire to want to do something through the artwork that I have that's going to inspire people. I want it to be bigger than just a piece of artwork. I would love to do art for art's sake. That would be really a lot of fun and just, you know, draw superheroes all day long or whatever. But I would love to come up with things. I've got a little bird character named Wordsworth that I created back in 1980. And he's a little kind of a funny looking bird with a with a uh, Indiana Jones hat on. And he wears a backpack. And we called him Wordsworth because he carried the Bible with him, the word. And see, so he's got a little duck character, a little mallard duck that's uh, he's called Diddle E. Squat. <laughs> And uh, he's, he's the maladjusted mallard. And so I've got a few other characters. And I, I used to do, um, for my church, they would have a, a very large uh, summer camp for the kids. And so I would get a chance to do uh, an illustration for that summer camp. They would have a theme, and then I would use Wordsworth in those things. And so for a while there, I had an opportunity. I was hoping to maybe be able to market him in doing cards and posters and different things like that that would encourage people. I didn't get very far with that, and so I kind of laid it down and didn't do much with it. But now I'm, I'm getting more interested because I see today that there's a place for that to encourage people and try to make them feel more valued. A lot of people don't feel like they have a lot of worth today and things like that. And I just want to reach those kind of folks that would make people feel like that they are, they're valued by God, that they have talents and abilities and stuff. It's easy to go and do this workaday world and stuff nine to five. And you come home, make dinner, you go to bed, you get up, you do it all over again and stuff. I guess I want to do something that's, that's going to make a difference in people's lives where they see it, maybe if it's hanging on their wall or maybe they get a card in the mail or something that's got my characters on it or whatever, something that's going to be encouraging to them. My gift is encouragement and exhortation and stuff. I love to do that. I just know that if I could do that for people with the artwork that I have, that would be just a great goal for me. Well, I think you're already <laughs> on your way for doing that. So D, I'm so happy that, um, you know, we've gotten to interview you today and we're actually up on the last question, but um, we're just going to wrap it up here. So, you know, for you, you've done plenty of artwork that has been memorable to multiple people even if you feel like it hasn't made a dent in their life it totally has so that being said in your opinion what makes a piece of art truly memorable or powerful that is a great question danny honestly well if you look at the old masters you know and you think well you you see what leonardo da vinci did and you you can't get that out of your head you know those things are just memorable you're going to remember them forever the art history that i did when i was in college i still remember so many of those uh so many of those great uh, Titian and Greco and, you know, all these guys and stuff, they were just so amazing. I know I'll never be one of those. And it's not like I aspire to be, you know. I mean, a thousand years from now and stuff, if the world's still here and stuff, you know, nobody's going to probably be going, I've got a D. Deloitte t-shirt, man, you know. <laughs> but that's not what really, what I'm really aspiring to. I think I would just love to see the opportunity to be able to make people know that they are important. And if I can use the artwork that I have to be able to do that and stuff, I would be a happy man going out. That's probably the biggest thing that I would love to do because I feel like that everybody needs, they need to know that they have got value and worth. And so that's probably probably my biggest deal and stuff that I'm looking for. Well, Dee, 
This interview has been fantastic. The whole process of what went into this masterpiece, your entire career as an artist, um, it's all culminating into you winning the Best of Show Award. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time. And uh, this was really fantastic. Well, Danny, I just want to say thank you to uh, Central Florida Lifestyle Magazine. They are just amazing. You know, I was getting it in the mail and I would look it over. I had no idea after looking at that for a couple of years now or whatever that I would ever be on the front cover of your magazine, let alone having three wonderful pages in the book and then having you come and do a video uh, of me, uh, of this piece of artwork. I'm so grateful to you. I'm grateful to them. Uh, grateful to God for the opportunity and stuff that this is uh, creating. And I don't know where it's going to go from here. I told your editor, I said, I think that this is bigger than what we can imagine. I think that uh, I told her, I said, you know, let's do this right, because I think that God's got something else bigger for this than than me or anybody else. But but you all have been such a conduit to be able to do. The fact is, is this thing hangs in the Corey Ten Boom Museum in Holland. Wow. And that was the first step that I would have never thought of. And then second of all is that I would have won this this uh, great award and everything, which really means everything to me. But those are stepping stones that I think that somehow the message that Corey Ten Boom has, the message of forgiveness, the message of saving 800 Jews that they did, you know, there's so much about all of this message that comes from just, not not from this picture, but I have to tell you this, though. The, the watches down here, they are symbolic of the faces of the people that were inside the walls to save them from the Nazis being able to find them. So they saved over 800 Jews by putting them inside the walls of their of their uh, their building, and so when I was drawing these, I was just using these to be a filler basically for what I had down at the bottom here. Until one night, I got this inspiration, and I knew it just had to be the voice of the Lord telling me that these weren't just watches; these were faces of real people that were in the dark, sitting back behind a wall for days and everything, trying to save their lives and everything. And man, I broke down just doing that. So there's so much more to all of this that I, than I, and I'm, I'm anxious to see maybe where it goes from here. I don't know. But, but being here with you and being able to do this has just been uh, everything. It's very great. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much for your time, Dee. Sure. Thanks so much, Danny. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. And folks, uh, we'll put all of this stuff in a link below and uh, check it out.